good afternoon friends uh i know the post lunch sessions are extremely difficult uh i'm very uneasy standing at one place and giving my lecture uh, i like to be mobile myself and that's why i have taken this hand mic and i will try to go very slowly so that my friends sitting there uh, they get sufficient time to translate my lecture in korean and those who can understand among the korean english language it becomes easier for them to comprehend what i am going to present today so first of all thank you very much for giving me this opportunity this is a great honor and privilege for me to present to this youngsters uh, something about pv inspections and pv audits so let me ask you one question do you feel this person looks terrifying yes or no uh, if uh, i have failed uh, then it's my uh, failure basically i wanted to show that when there is going to be a pv inspection normally uh, people are terrified they have a sense of fear that what is going to happen and why because this person the regulatory inspector who comes to the marketing authorization holder has tremendous authority with him and he can grant sanctions he can seize samples he can close your clinical research sites he can also uh, you know cancel the marketing authorizations of companies then he can issue you a warning letter and you cannot stop him from his job if you try to stop him you can be prosecuted criminally so he comes with lot of authority and that's why people are normally very afraid of facing a pharmacovigilance inspection done by regulators of the world whether it is FDA MHRA or EMA or any other uh, drug regulatory authority so in today's presentation what i'm going to take you through uh the basic definition or understanding of what is an inspection vis-a-vis -vis an audit why should we have pv audits and inspections what are the different types of audits and inspection what are the scopes how do we prepare during the inspection what we are supposed to be doing after the inspection what you are supposed to be doing general finding trends and then of course capas and responses and after that we will have the question answer session so if you see this definition friends uh let me explain it to you when we talk of an audit we are talking about a systematic examination which is also independent of the activities and the processes to assess or to evaluate that the processes and activities which have been undertaken by a marketing authorization holder they are in line with the policies and with the regulations against a particular well defined standards and when the same examination is being carried out by a regulatory authority the same examination is called an inspection regulatory inspection but of course there is lot of difference between a regulatory inspection and internal pv audit as you realize that the gentleman who whom you saw in my previous slide he is a much more important personnel and his findings can be very very 
serious repercussions for the marketing authorization holder or to the pharmaceutical industry in general because he can issue you a warning letter he can cancel your marketing authorization holder your product goes into limbo or he when he issues a 483 the 483 warning letter is not between the inspector between the fda and the company it goes on to the us fda website and everybody who has access to US FDA website, he will come to know that this company had a 483 and all the loopholes, all the findings, all the gaps which have been found out during this inspection will be there on the web page of US FDA MedWatch for everybody else to see and no company would like to see their name on US FDA web page. So that's why he is a very important person and that's why the regulatory inspections are much more serious stuff compared to the internal audit because internal audit is an internal matter between the organization and their PV team and their teams which are responsible for the PV operations and processes. Even if there are findings, these findings are restricted to the internal stakeholders. But wait, now the situation has changed. You must have heard that in EU, you need to have a PSMF. And in the PSMF, there is an annexure in which all the critical findings, all the major findings, which have come out of either internal audit or by an external PV inspection, you are supposed to include all these major and critical findings in your PSMF annexure. What do you mean by this? It means that if any regulatory authority asks you for your PSMF, and if they go through the annexures, they would immediately know what are the gaps, what are the deficiencies in your pharmacovigilance system. And that's why even from that perspective, nobody would like to have deficiencies in their pharmacovigilance system. So when we talk of an audit, or when we talk of a inspection, these three terms are very important. The four terminology is what I have pointed out here. Systematic, independent, examination, and defined requirements. Systematic means when the auditors come, they just don't come haphazardly and pick up any document or call anybody and take his interview, but they have a very well-planned agenda they know what products to look into, what documents to look into, who are the people they are going to be interviewed. So this is a very systematic approach. Secondly, it has to be an independent, unbiased examination of the activities. This is very important. Me as a pharmacovigilance manager, I cannot do or audit my own processes because I'm expected to be biased. So it has to be unbiased examination and the unbiased examination can be done only by an independent auditor an independent pendant inspector and defined requirement if i want to know the deficiencies if i want to know the areas where there are issues then against what i will say that they are not in line with or they are non-compliant so naturally you have to have predefined requirements in terms of your company policies sops regulations all over the world whether it is fda regulations or ema or your own country's regulations so these regulations policies and sops will form the defined requirement and against this your processes will be audited or inspected to see whether you are compliant with this or you are not compliant with this. So, why you want to have 
audits and inspection. For a simple thing that we want to have audits and inspections to see whether our processes which are there in place, they are compliant with the SOPs, they are compliant with the regulations, and whether they are safe enough, we take care of the PV obligations which have been entrusted on us, we being the marketing authorization holder. And that is the biggest thing what the regulator and the inspectors are supposed to be doing because they are the watchdogs. They are responsible for public health and safety. And they would definitely like to know that all the pharmaceutical companies who are either doing clinical trials with new drugs are those who are marketing their drugs to millions of the people, they have some PV obligations and the inspectors would like to know, the regulators would like to know whether all this marketing authorization holder, this pharma companies, the people who are doing clinical trial, they are taking sufficient uh, measure to see or ensure health and safety and the well-being of the public in general and they also follow the rules and the regulations. The lady said, the lady asked the question, what happens if somebody does not report in an expedited manner an ICSR which was supposed to be reported to FDA in 15 calendar days? There were actually these inspections and audits come into play. When I go to audit some place or my client, I would, it is not only a single isolated case which, uh, you know, which actually raises issues or concern. If you have been reporting all the ICSR which are supposed to be reported in an expedited manner in 15 days time, 99% you have been compliant. Only if you have one or two cases because of some genuine problem, like the lady said, it is okay, the auditor and also the inspectors can understand this. But if there is a total failure that out of 100 reports, more than 50, 60, 40 reports have not been reported in time frame which was required, then there is a gap. Then there is a deficiency. There is a problem with the system on which you are operating that your system is not efficient enough that it is not reporting the expedited report in the time frame it should be reported. So that's why the PV inspection and the audits become very, very essential. It is a tool which actually gives you the health of your PV processes, your PV operations, your personnel who are responsible for your PV operations. So that's why then you also continuously keep on, uh, you know, uh, improving your system through corrective and preventive actions. My next slide uh, deals with the what are the type of uh, PV system audits. So you have different type of audits. You have system audits, you have affiliate audits, you have business partner audits, you have vendor audits, so there are various type of PV audits. When we talk of the PV system audits, it is the headquarter, it is the PV headquarters who is responsible at a corporate level to manage the entire pharmacovigilance of all the drugs which are marketed and all the drugs are INDs where the clinical trials are currently ongoing. So there could be various domains, there could be various functions which needs to be audited or which needs to be inspected. It could be the, uh, okay, so global pharmacovigilance system headquarters. Then you can imagine a big pharma company like Johnson & Johnson or a Roche who is operating in more than 100 countries and they have various affiliate offices, then they would like to see that how each affiliate country is operating as far as their pharmacovigilance is concerned. So there again, you have to have affiliate audits, then you need to have your marketing and distributors 
PV audit, then you also need to have the uh, your uh, vendors in case if you have outsourced some of the pharmacovigilance activity to your vendors. Today, as you must be knowing, a lot of pharma companies are outsourcing their PV work to various CROs, various KPOs. India is very famous for that. Today we have got KPOs with hundreds of pharmacovigilance experts working in these KPOs. And we have an estimated around 80% of the world's ICSRs are being processed today in India. 80% ICSRs are being outsourced to India for processing. So it becomes very important as an auditor, as a company, I would like to see how my vendor is processing my cases. As USFDA, they would be also interested to know that if Johnson & Johnson or Roche has outsourced their entire case processing to TCS in India, or Cognizant or Accenture, they would like to know how Accenture or Cognizant or TCS is processing cases for these multinational companies. So they would also like to inspect the vendors at the same time the companies would like their internal audit team to visit and audit their vendors to see that their vendor is doing a good job and the SLA or the service level agreement which is being put between the vendor and the, the, the service provider and the company the vendor is really complying with the SLA. So these type of audits are very, very common. Now global PV system audits. So when we talk of PV system at a global level, we are not talking of one department or one function. People do not have an idea that when we talk of a global pharmacovigilance system and the headquarters of a Roche, of a Johnson & Johnson, of a Sanofi Aventis, how many people might be working in the global pharmacovigilance system? There are hundreds of people working in the global pharmacovigilance system because one group is responsible for maintaining the quality of the pharmacovigilance systems. Another group is looking after the ICSR and reporting. The third group is responsible for creating, generating, and sending the PSUR, the aggregate report. There is another group which is continuously looking after the signal management. There is one more group which is looking after the literature search, worldwide literature surveillance. So there are so many. Then another a very important, that is the QPPV, as you must be knowing that all the companies who have their operations in EU, QPPV is a must, qualified pharmacovigilance personnel. Until unless you have a QPPV, you cannot operate in EU. QPPV is the spine of the pharmaceutical company in a European setup. So a company would definitely like to know how the QPPV is performing because he is one of the most important kingpin in the entire PV operations of a pharmaceutical company in, in EU. So when the <coughs> inspectors come, the QPPV also is one of the focused area how the QPPV and its office is working and showing due diligence with respect to pharmacovigilance. So these, these, and then pharmacovigilance system master file, that's what I was talking to you about, about the PSMF. The PSMF becomes one of the most important document today in an EU perspective. So if, if you are in EU, the QPPV is supposed to be the owner of the PSMF. He is supposed to keep the PSMF where he is located and if the inspection takes place, then you can always expect that the inspectors or the auditors would ask for the PSMF because it gives you a complete and comprehensive picture about the processes, about people, about the technology, about the audits and about their quality program. Every damn thing is available in the PSMF. 
in a big company if you see the psmf the psmf may go to hundreds of pages giving all the important details about the pharmacovigilance system so these i i've just given you a brief uh, description that these could be possibly the system audit uh, you know the titles for which you would be required to do a system audit similarly affiliate pv audit now i have been doing a lot of pv audits for affiliate for two three multinational companies and normally people when they talk about affiliate pv audit they think that okay the auditor comes and he goes to the affiliate and just talk to the representative we call as affiliate safety representative some people call it as local safety officer lso there are various designations and terminologies being used so what is expected why because i have got two three slides which i would like to explain you people that when the affiliate audit takes place it is not only the lso it is not only the affiliate safety representative who is being focused but our idea is to have a totality a picture a full picture a big picture of the affiliate countries in terms of pharmacovigilance so when we talk of pharmacovigilance pharmacovigilance never stands alone right there are so many interfacing departments and functions which play hand in hand with pharmacovigilance for example you take regulatory affair right the regulatory affair people are very important people because they are the people who sometimes submit the reports to the regulatory authorities they are the people who submits the psur to the regulatory authority they are the people who submit the safety variations and get the approval of the safety variation and along with the marketing and the pv department they implement the safety variation into new layer pack inserts so this is one of the important interface the second important interface could be the medical affair people medical affair people are involved in clinical research in post marketing safety studies they are also doing some other studies like uh, you know you have market research program uh, then you have patient support program where mama MA or uh, medical affair people are involved and all these domains pharmacovigilance becomes one of the key factors so we would also like to see the medical affair people accordingly and similarly there are marketing people there are sales people we would like to see how the sales people have been trained how the distributors have been trained do they know their uh, pharmacovigilance obligation they know that when they receive a safety information for our product how to report where to report and what are the timelines to report so we had to go and check those people as well then it becomes a very important uh, stakeholder in the affiliate world because they are the people who are actually managing the entire it today we are working with so many software including the safety database most of the people are now using aries or argus and so many other uh, safety database so you need to have it people for validation for implementation every 6 months you get a medra update right so who is responsible for dumping or this medra update up up versioning of your safety database so you have to also look into the it piece of it whether they have business continuity program whether they have drp in place there there are so many questions around it so i am just telling you that there are regulatory affair clinical operation medical information sales and marketing information technology i have just taken a few important pieces which ne which needs to be looked into when we do the audit of an affiliate level okay similarly we have marketing partner audit we would like to know that the our marketing partner who is marketing our products but we are the marketing authorization holder we have an sdea safety data exchange agreement with our marketing partner we must ensure that he is really complying with all the clauses of safety data exchange agreement if he doesn't report to us in the timelines what we have asked him naturally we will not be able to report to the regulators in the time frame which we want so we have audits for 
marketing partners and there are various scope like I talked to you about the scope of the affiliate. Similarly, there is scope for marketing partner audits and uh, let me go back to, okay, let's go back to the inspection now. So, <clears throat> as I was speaking, uh, why, why we have PV inspection? The PV inspection, the first objective is that every health authority would like to know whether the pharmaceutical company are taking sufficient precautions, measure to ensure the safety and well-being of the patients to whom they are selling their product. And in case if it is not, then they should, how sanctions should be provided so that they improve upon their systems and so that the health and the well-being well of the patients and the public in general is being taken care of. To use the inspection result as a basis for enforcement action where considered necessary. That means if the inspectors come and if they find that there are issues, then they may issue a 483 or they may ask you to take certain corrective and preventive action so that your systems will have much better performance than before. So what are the types of inspections? So there are routine inspection, there are re-inspections. Routine inspections means uh, all the big regulators, they have risk-based approach. So naturally you cannot expect Gerald's team to go to each and every pharmaceutical company in the United States and in the, all the other countries from where drugs are being imported to USA in a three years time. Right, that was the first uh, estimate of MHRA that they said to themselves that they would like to go to each and every MAH once in three years. And then they realized this was humanly impossible. The same thing for USFDA that they cannot go to all the uh, marketing authorization holder, the pharma companies once in three years. So all these regulators, they have a risk-based approach. They have various criteria, various parameter for all the companies and they work out which are the companies which has got the highest risk. And they pick up first top few companies, suppose if they have sufficient number of manpower to do 50 audits in a year, they will pick up 50 companies who have got the highest risk number or risk score in the, uh, in the total list of say 1,000 companies or so. So that's how they do the inspection. Reinspection, when they feel that after the inspection, they feel that there are serious and critical findings from a one particular company. They would like to revisit that company maybe next year or after six months. I know one company who was visit. Uh, I mean, we were visited at least three years back to back because there were important finding or critical finding by MHRA. And MHRA kept visiting our office at least for three years till they were sub, uh, till they were satisfied, and all the major and critical findings were resolved. So this could be re, this could be reinspection. There could be a four cause audit. If the regulator suspect some false play, uh, there are some issues. Then probably it triggers a four cause audit. If they suspect a fraud, cheating or something like that, they may come to you uh, for a four-cause audit without notification. Then you may have, uh, you know, a, a re-inspection, announced and unannounced inspection. Uh, I wanted to cover this. Uh, you know, the MHRA normally gives you one month to three months notice, but USFDA normally does not give you notice. USFDA may come to your reception anytime, give their uh, identification that they are here for inspection and that's it. From there onwards for two days, three days, the number of inspectors can do the pharmacovigilance inspection of your site and for, of your PV processes. So these are the various type of 
PV inspections, uh, how inspections are planned. Uh, some of this I have already covered. Uh, there are also certain, um, you know, criteria or certain situation which trigger uh, pharmacovigilance inspection. So change of QPPV, or uh, if there were no previous inspection, mergers and acquisition, uh, outsourcing, new safety database if you have acquired, these are the various circumstances where your pharmacovigilance system becomes very vulnerable. So this is the time that they would like to inspect you. When your QPPV has left, a new QPPV has joined in. When you have changed your safety database from RSG to Argus, or there are mergers or acquisition of two big pharma companies, both of them working on different pharmacovigilance system. Now how a combined pharmacovigilance system is working, are there loopholes? Are there deficiencies? These are the time when you can expect that uh, regulators may do uh, pharmacovigilance inspections. Okay, so let's go one by one. I, I have already told you that there is a very little, I mean, in principle, inspections are nothing but the audits conducted by regulatory authority. The difference is there that the inspections are formal examination has got serious repercussion as compared to the internal audit, which is the internal matter of an organization. Uh, there's a difference between uh, the type and style of um, EMA inspections and the FDA inspections. Uh, as I said, I would repeat, US FDA normally does not give you any advance notice. If at all they give, they may give two, three days advance notice, but most of the time they come spontaneously and without notice as compared to MHRA or EMA, they normally give one month to three months notice. There is no questionnaire being sent by US FDA to the auditees or to the company, but MHRA and EMA normally gives you a questionnaire, a peak inspection questionnaire, they draw and they collect a lot of information uh, before they actually come and the MHRA and EMA inspections are more interview driven. They are specialists drawn from pharmacovigilance domain who come and do the inspection. So that is the slight uh, differences between the style of FDA and EMA. Uh, okay. So what I'm trying to say in this, uh, in this slide is any audit or any inspection gives you a lot of opportunity to do some introspection, gives an opportunity to improve your system. So one should be very positive and one should not be anxious about the outcome, of course, that in case if we have big deficiencies, then our company needs to be uh, concerned about. And I can tell you that no company can be audit ready at the last or inspection ready at the last minute. If you want to be inspection ready, every day, every minute, you have to follow your systems, your processes, your personal need to show due diligence in terms of management of records, training, and other things. So these offer an opportunity to demonstrate your competencies, improve procedures and processes, and have, have an external perspective to argue for change. Sometimes I, as a QPPV, or I, as a PV manager, wants to make some changes, but the senior management is not listening to me. When the same thing comes as a recommendation or same thing comes as a finding from the regulators, then I have a point, I can go back to the senior management and tell them, look, I was telling you this, that we need to make these changes and you did not listen to me. Now this has come in our inspection finding. And that is the time when the senior management would really listen to your suggestion because now this has come from the 
regulators. So, uh, this is a life cycle of, uh, you know, audit readiness. So what happens? Uh, you have an audit notification. So as an auditor, I normally send an audit notification two to three months in advance so that my auditees know that audit is going to take place. So we normally uh, work with each other and decide all the dates based on their availability and convenience and based on the auditor's convenience. This, of course, doesn't happen in case of an inspection. Like for FDA, you have got no choice. With EMA and MHRA, you can definitely negotiate with them, but negotiate with them in a way that does not raise suspicion, okay? That you are trying to postpone their visit. If you have some genuine problem, like if EMA or MHRA is coming to India during Diwali vacation, which is our biggest vacation where most of the people are going on leave and they don't know that, and if they say that we would like to come between 24th and 30th of October, which is our Diwali long weekend, we can always subtly request them that this weekend is not suitable for us. By and large, most of the pharma companies would not like to take chances to raise suspicion. Whichever days are being proposed, they normally accept that days, except for internal audit, of course, this is between them and the internal auditor. They can always sh shift or uh, swap the days as per the convenience. Pre-document, uh, uh, pre-audit documents. Normally, uh, the internal auditor sent a pre-audit document request. Uh, there are a lot of questions asking about the product, asking about the SOPs, asking about the uh, audits which have been performed previously. Uh, about the regulations of that particular country and there are so many documents which I normally get before I go to the audit. So intern cross-functional uh, readiness, you have to keep everybody informed that you are going to have an audit. And during the audit, regulatory affair people, marketing affair, sales and marketing, IT, you, you, everybody is going to be involved, so you better be prepared for that. So they prepare for themselves, including the HR. Okay, so this is the internal communication. I, I will just like to know, I would just like to share with you internal communication, how important this is, how important this is. Most of the big pharma companies have got a blueprint for inspection preparedness, right? So I will give you an example. When I was in Sanofi Aventis and Johnson, Johnson and Johnson, the minute regulators or inspectors or USFDA come to our um, Bridgewater office, which was our, where our pharmacovigilance processing, uh, pharmacovigilance headquarters were there in US, 15 minutes within the US FDA inspectors coming at our reception, there used to be a communication from our headquarters PV that US FDA regulators are here at our site for inspection. That is the type of communication and the type of mechanism almost all the big pharma companies have. They know that once the inspector come to the receptionist, receptionist should know whom to contact immediately. She or he will immediately contact the quality assurance guy who is supposed to take care of the inspectors. This guy in turn has got a long distribution list for communication that from here onwards, this, 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 this person needs to be informed. And those person in terms will be reporting and informing that Johnson & Johnson or Sanofi Zaventis is having a regulatory inspection. It goes to all the affiliate, all the business partner, all the stakeholders within half an hour's time. That is the type of preparations that is the type of blueprint which you need to have. So this communication is very, very important. And then you need to have a task force. How you will tackle the auditor 
and the auditing team and also the inspectors and the inspection team. So basically you would have a room where let out and then you will have a back room or we also call this a war room from where all the uh, documents will be provided to the auditors or to the inspectors. There will be a systems there that in the war room or in the room from where documents will be provided. There will be one quality assurance person, one PV documentation person, and third person, there would be Xerox machines. The questions are the documents requested by the inspectors are the uh, auditors would be checked, understood that what documents are required, these documents would be removed from the files, from the archives, they would be checked by the quality assurance person whether this is correct or not, they would be copied, one copy will be sent to the inspectors and auditor, the other copy would be kept there for their own uh, reference that these were the, uh, you know, documents which were provided to uh, the inspectors and the auditors and this would be documented. So this is a very well elaborate system uh, you have to operate upon. Uh, this I have already covered that there are a lot of other departments and functions which are actually involved in an audit and in an inspection. Uh, so what, what, what we normally look at, what an inspector is normally look at. So there are various things. Uh, various aspects of pharmacovigilance systems which an auditor or which inspectors would look into. They would look into AE reports, the ICSRs, what we were talking about since morning. Uh, they would see the PV resources, how many PV resources are there, the training of the PV resources. This is very important. If you will find that as an auditor, I will always have uh, findings regard, uh, regarding the training simple finding about the training that a person has started working on a software on a safety database new version without being trained before so he has already started working on the production environment though he was not signed off on that particular date so the, these are the, some of the things which uh, as an auditor you have to look into it then contracts and agreements whether you have good csda with your partners or there are loopholes there uh, some of the clauses are not being defined well, or uh, even if there there are whether there are periodic reconciliation taking place between your business partner and you, then business continuity plan. What is your documentation retention and archival? This is a big problem. Most of the people define as per their company policy that the document should be retained for ten years. No, all PV documents need to be retained indefinitely. That, that's, that's the uh, best uh, global business practice that pharmacovigilance document, especially the source documents are retained uh, uh, indefinitely because this may be required at any point of the time during the life cycle of that particular molecule. Then, uh, source of A reports, I mean, of course, I am not going to go into all these details. When you talk of, about the AEs or ICSR, naturally ICSRs will be coming from, from various sources and all these sources needs to be seen. You may get a spontaneous reports, you may get reports from clinical trial, you may get reports from PSPs, you may get reports from market research programs, you may get reports from literature search. You also need to have local literature search like my um, ASR, uh, my LSO sitting in, in um, Korea, uh, we expect that the Korean LSO would be doing literature search for Korean local journals because the corporate pharmacovigilance people, they only do international database search through Embase and Medline and they do not get the Korean journals which are not indexed in that. So the expectation is that the, all the local safety officers sitting in various countries, they would be doing the literature search of the local journals. And you get reports from health authorities. So all these reports, we will have to take a sample of this report, see how these reports are being processed, how these have been databased, whether there is accuracy, in transmitting this paper file into your safety database, your day zero understanding is correct, your translation, like 
for example in china in korea in other countries where i have been traveling and i am doing audit most of the source document are most of the first adr report which is which comes to the asr they are in their local language it could be in korean it could be in chinese language it could be in japanese language and the asr translate this into english to make the data entry into the safety database many times i have found out that there are lots of issues and problems in translating this local document or local terminologies into english and there is no local quality assurance or quality control check after the translation this is one of the findings which i am very used to this so these are the various type of the sources where you have to see the sources of the reports uh okay let's let me go back to this i mean i cannot go into details uh, subject to be audited then qppv okay let's go to the training uh, training is a big area uh, all the regulators and all the auditors would like to know how well trained your personnel are who are responsible directly for handling and processing pv and those who are not directly responsible indirectly but through them you get the pharmacovigilance uh, data like your medical reps uh, like your distributors how you have well trained these people so these trainings are very important training for your pharmacovigilance expert staff so they should know everything about what they are dealing in and out they should know the regulations they know all the sops they should know how to process the data using the database how to archive how to report all these things they should be pv personnel should be actually trained employees yes they don't need to be reported or they don't need to be trained on the safety database but what you should try or what we should try that they should be at least trained to know what are the pv obligations that in case he they get any ae information regarding their own product what are the timelines what is the process and who is the person to whom they are supposed to report and now the requirement and the best practice is that every year you have to have a refresher pv training program for all your non pv employees and your distributors and business partners this is a requirement and this is the best practice so we have to ensure that the training matrix which we make for entire company in this training matrix we also keep a regular annual pv refresher training program for all the company employees including vendors and distributors okay okay so how is the audit sequence L let me quickly go through that what happens during an inspection what happens during an audit so we have already intimated we have already uh, discussed the dates we have sent the agenda agenda is being filled by the auditees that okay for this session this person is going to represent for this session this person is going to represent so we get the audit agenda prior to going there on the site similarly when we go on the site the very first day the opening meeting is very important when when most of the senior management people including the pv managers and the pv staff attend the opening meeting in the opening meeting is basically to understand the methodology about the audit and the inspection i mean this is made very clear what are the expectations of the inspectors what are the uh, expectations of the audit auditors and this in this you know everything is made very clear the audit agenda is being again reconfirmed in case if there are some changes required to be done because of non availability of the people this is always done in the uh, first meeting which is known as the opening meeting and once your opening meeting is finished then you start with the actual audit or actual inspection now what happens during the actual inspection or actual audit takes place as per the agenda we call the people who are representing or the case processing or those who are responsible for signal management or psur and they are being questioned 
they are being questioned and this is being documented by the auditor during an inspection you can also have a scribe within the audit room so that the scribe will pen down every question which has been asked by the inspectors and what answers have been given to the inspectors this is for their own safeguard besides this the auditor and inspection inspector from time to time they will ask for some more document they may ask document of some sops they may ask for some training records they may ask for some case files so normally we use a document request sheet and that's what is being also used by by most of the inspector they would write down the document number and what document they are asking and this will go to the auditees and this from the auditees will go to the back room or the war room i told told you about there are people who are responsible for managing the back room and they would see what all documents are required and these documents will be sent back to the audit auditor and to the to the inspectors now please remember that this is a very important session and me as an auditor and inspector and also you as an auditees you have certain do's uh, certain do's and don'ts which we must keep in mind one of the important don'ts is that don't get anxious be calm as an auditor also it is my responsibility to make my auditees calm quiet and not to intimidate them this is very important as an auditees it's very important to know that in case if you do not know the answer you should plainly say i do not know rather than faking an answer or giving a wrong answer even if you have given a wrong answer you always have an opportunity to come back to the auditor or come back to the inspector and say my apologies i i actually presented a wrong data this is the correct data so can you please change change your remark you it is always there and that's what you can always do whatever documents you are giving please check twice whether you are giving a complete neat document this document procurement and document uh, you know uh, compliance also plays a very important role they would like to see how much time do you take to get a requested just uh, signal me when my time is over okay so they would like to know how much time you are taking to get that document are you fudging the document are you manipulating the document if any inspector or any auditor gets any suspicion that the document which i have asked you are not giving in time you are manipulating or you are fudging he can come down to the archives he can come down to your uh, back room and in case if you have if you if he finds you red handed he can seal the entire campus so please don't do anything please remember that the auditors and inspectors are very sharp and smart people they know what they are asking and they know what they are doing so please don't try to fool inspectors and auditors and once this entire audit and inspection is closed you have a closing uh, meeting on the last day last session where again all the auditees who have been audited they can come and assemble including the senior managers and the inspectors and the auditors normally come up with their first impression they give their observations that these are my observations as an auditor we normally do not classify or rate our observations there are major or minor or recommendation or critical until unless we have sufficient evidence in hand on that particular during two or three days time that yes this is a critical finding this is a big deficiency only that would be disclosed to the senior management and this would be escalated because we would like them to start the corrective and preventive action for the critical deficiencies immediately and not wait 
for 30 days to get them the audit report or the inspection report. So that's how the uh, closing takes place and during closing again when the auditor, when the inspector is describing his findings and observations and if you feel that there is something which is not correct, you can always raise your hand, stand up and say, Mr. Moin, you are wrong. The observation what you have stated is not like this. I have something else which I can provide to you. So friend, this is a big area. I have taken much more time than what was allocated to me. I will be very happy to take some questions in case if you have uh, anything for me and um, I'm sure that uh, you did not disappoint uh, Gerald. So uh, I think at least one or two questions will come on my way also. Uh, this, of course, the entire presentation is available uh, and you can always write to me on this in case if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your active presentation. 어, 저희 질문 한두 개 정도 받도록 하겠습니다. 굉장히 열정적인 발표 해주셨는데요. 아마 열정적인 호응을 또 보여주시면 어, 발표자님께서도 굉장히 좋아하실 것 같습니다. 질문 있으신 분은 어, 통로 측에 마이크 사용해서 질문해 주시면 되겠습니다. Any question? 뭐 평소에 궁금하셨던 거라도 질문하셔도 괜찮을 것 같은데요. not understand anything <laughs> I'm so disappointed I think it, it was the presentation was so perfect that's why that see, see, everything was there so are only two, <laughs> two scenarios one you did not understand anything and you understood everything so second scenario is not possible but you cannot likely. understand <laughs> everything See, if he has come from US, I have come all the way from Mumbai. So not if 10,000 miles, a few miles, little less than 10,000, but at least one question, 네. if not three questions. 발표자분께서 실망하지 않도록 한분 어떻게 발표, 아니, 질문 Korean? 괜찮으실까요? No? <laughs> ah, okay, there he is. This is a quick question. Um, where can we access the presentation? <laughs> yes. Presentation is there uh, in the booklet. Oh, no, I mean, is that available online? You're talking in English? Sorry? You're talking in English? <laughs> then I <laughs> translation. Yeah, I am talking English, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, could we get that online, the presentation? Shall I speak Korean? Co you are going to speak in Korea? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it is there in our uh, booklet. Um, basically, we are in the beginning of setting up uh, internal PV or audit. What would be the first step for us to do? So <laughs> Before setting up? Yeah, we're just beginning to set up an internal PV audit. So what would be the first step for us to take? Okay, so uh, for PV audit, uh, you will have to first uh, earmark some people uh, who would be from quality assurance department who have some quality assurance background and also those who have some PV domain knowledge and expertise because for a PV auditor it is necessary that he has an auditing skills and he also have some PV domain knowledge because you cannot expect anybody to become a PV auditor until unless he has some PV domain knowledge, how you would find out deficiencies in the PV processes. So that's why you will have to get somebody who has some PV experience and also has some uh, quality assurance who has a auditing skill set, 
right? You will have to train them. You will have to have your own processes or SOPs in place that how you are going to audit. You will have to define your audit universe that, okay, these are the areas which you need to audit. And then slowly, slowly you can start with, uh, you know, audit of your internal department and then go on to the your external business partners and things like that so you will have to ha you will have to identify people you will have to train them and before that you will have to have your processes your sops then train them on this and then you start doing pv audits uh thanks uh, so basically for local companies pv is a kind of a new area for us so we've been doing QA activities, uh, but the area is new that we have to study them from the beginning. So yeah. we are actually writing SOPs at the moment. Sure. But what would be the best, uh, I don't know, source we can get? See, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, for PV auditors, there are no courses available, mm. okay? There are some ISO lead auditors courses, which I have also attended, but unfortunately it is not very relevant to PV auditing. It is entirely a different uh, domain. Uh, but what you can do, there are uh, uh, EU good pharmacovigilance module oh, yeah. on inspection and auditing and also quality QMS is the module one. So if you and the people who want to take up this should go through module one, module two, and module three, so that you will have more information on PV auditing and PV inspection. That should be able to help you. Yeah, that's exactly, um, we've started with the sure. GVP, um, so okay. That would be great. You can take some question off the line, I'm there. So in case if you need some more, I will be able to uh, I'll email you, yeah? Yeah. Okay, sure. thanks. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 네, 혹시 한번더 저쪽에 질문 있으시다고 하시는데요? 네, 사실 한국이라서 조금 먼 이야기긴 합니다. 근데 지금 브렉시트가 곧 눈앞에 닥쳐 있고 저희는 바이오벤처가 많기 때문에 유럽에 진출하고 싶은 그들을 위해서 브렉시트를 하게 되면 MHRA가 사실은 많은 부분 이런 오디시나 인스펙션에 관련되고 있었는데 그분들이 빠지게 되는 데 대한 어떤 트렌드나 프레퍼레이션이 있는지 궁금합니다. There was no translation of this. So the question is about the Brexit. So ever since Johnson has taken over, uh, now uh, it is quite likely that Brexit would happen whether with deal or no deal. And MHRA will separate out from EMA, and of course it will have its impact over pharmacovigilance processes, it will have impact on the QPPV. The expectations is that uh, MHRA, which they have already shifted their headquarters, they would ask for EU QPPV to be based in EU outside UK. So there are questions about 3,000 QPPVs who are residing in, uh, in UK. Uh, people think that MHRA will ask to have separate QPPV for UK itself. So all those QPPVs who are now residing in UK would become UK based QPPV for MHRA and then all the companies will have to have separate QPPV for EMA and I know many many companies recently whom I audited they have already started having process in place they have started negotiation with QPPV or pot potential QPPV to be placed either in Amsterdam or elsewhere. So I think uh, most of the pharma companies have started uh, working on the Brexit uh, issues and which is going to impact the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Okay? Thank you. 네, 더 질문 없으시면 이번 발표는 여기서 마치도록 하겠습니다. 다시 한번 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation.